Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, I want to begin by thanking all of you for your prayers and your support. The last couple of weeks when I was in Phoenix at the Best Practices in Ministry Conference and where I was a speaker and made a presentation last week. But you know, I almost missed my session. I was presenting on Saturday, the last day of the conference, and my session was at 8.30 to 10 o'clock in the morning. And of course, that meant I had to get up extra early. I had to pack all of my bags. I had to check out of my hotel. And I had to eat some breakfast so that I would have some energy to make my presentation. So I did all of that. And then I went out to catch the shuttle bus, the very first one that would leave at 7.30 because I needed to get to the classroom where I was presenting by 8 o'clock in order to set up the computer and to look at how to record the session. So as I walked out to the shuttle pickup spot, I saw the shuttle van there, and it was full. And as I walked toward it, it left. And I was panicking. I said, what am I going to do now? I need to get to my session on time. And so I pivoted and saw the sign that said, the shuttle runs in a 10 minute loop. A new shuttle will be there any minute. So I waited 10 minutes, 15 minutes go by, and now I'm starting to panic. So I pivoted again, and I called an Uber ride. But it was not going to arrive for another 20 minutes. It said, highly busy time. I guess everyone was trying to get to my session too. So I pivoted again. I decided I'll walk there. I can power walk there. So I started walking and pretty soon I took out my phone to get the exact directions and realized the church was four miles away. I was never going to make the time. So I pivoted one more time. I did the American thing. I hitchhiked. I asked for a ride. And sure enough, Right after that, a truck stops. And so I get in, I thank the man, I told him where I was going. He said, oh, I know where that is. Matter of fact, I know a shortcut. The back roads where there's no traffic. I was just grateful and thankful. And I said, the people here in Phoenix are so friendly compared to San Francisco where, you know, they would never pick up a hitchhiker. I mean, if they saw me, they would think, oh, I'm not going to pick up that guy. He, he, must, he might be some kind of a serial killer. And so the man said, oh, no, I'd never worry about that. I mean, what are the odds of two people in the same truck at the same time who are serial killers? <laughs> And so I pivot to our epiphany theme this season. The church, the church and her gifts, the church, her unity, the church, her love, her challenges, his power, his reign, and today his glory. And so during this epiphany season, we've learned about the blessing of spiritual gifts that God has given to us. How he gives them to us to build up his church. How we are recipients of being members of the body of Christ, where Jesus Christ is the head. And as we collaborate and work together, we help to build up the church. We learn about love, God's love, and that that is the greatest gift for us. That is what binds our gifts and our unity in Christ together. And we know we all have challenges. 
whether it is in life or in the church. And it's not so much whether you win or lose, succeed or fail in the challenges that you encounter, but that you meet each challenge with faith, knowing that God is the one who leads you through. And we know of his power in our lives, the power of Jesus' resurrection, that power which lifts us up and gives us hope at all times. And we know that Jesus reigns, that Jesus sits on the throne of our lives, that he is the one in charge. He is always in control. So even as we look around us and things seem to be in chaos, the Lord reigns. He is present. He will work for our good and for the sake of the world. And today we focus on His glory. The church and His glory. And we heard about Jesus' glory in our Transfiguration Sunday Gospel lesson. But let me ask you a trivia question. It's a little bit of a trick question. When does the season of Lent start? On Ash Wednesday. This coming Wednesday when we will have a 1 p.m. service. And you're all invited to come and observe the beginning of the season of Lent. But then when did the season of Epiphany end? Last Sunday. Because today is Transfiguration Sunday. So what is this time period in between? From last Sunday to Ash Wednesday. This 10 day period is really a pivotal moment. It is a time of pivoting. It is pivoting from Epiphany and the bright lights to now the season of Lent and the darkness of repentance. It is pivoting for Jesus in his whole ministry. I know you're all dying to see what I'm going to do with my basketball, right? I intentionally did not wear my robe so that I could dribble between my legs and behind my back and spin the ball. You know how basketballs are. When you have the ball in your hand, you can't just cut the ball and, you know, run with it like football, right? You can't do that. You have to dribble the ball, but if you're holding the ball, you have to have a pivot foot. You have to leave one foot unmoved. You cannot lift up the other foot or it would be a traveling violation. But when you have a pivot foot, you can spin, you can turn around and do all kinds of things, go back and forth. So in basketball, you can pivot to and you can pivot from. And so, that's what we can do. And I promise to show you how I can dribble, right? Okay, well, oh, so, so much for trying to do that. But pivoting is what Jesus was doing on Transfiguration Sunday. He was pivoting from his ministry in Galilee to his ministry in Jerusalem. He was pivoting from the teaching of the disciples and equipping them to now fulfilling the mission of the cross. He was pivoting from that ministry to the final ministry. And so Jesus goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And the very first verse, it says, eight days after saying these things, he took Peter and James and John to the mountaintop to pray. What were those things he was saying before eight days earlier? Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they responded, some say John the Baptist come back to life. Some say Moses or Elijah, one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter made that bold claim, that profession of faith, that assurance, with great confidence. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And then Jesus told about his betrayal. How he would be betrayed and suffer, falsely accused, beaten and battered and bruised, and that he would be crucified or nailed to a cross, that he would die. And on the third day, rise again. Jesus told the disciples, take up your cross and follow me. That's what Jesus was saying eight days prior. And now Jesus was pivoting from all of that to this mountain to pray. And those disciples were with him, his closest disciples. We kind of think those disciples were the inner circle disciples, those who were closest to Jesus, and that maybe they were the special disciples. The more I think about it, the more I think Peter, James, and John were in need of extra attention and extra training rather than being extra special. Look what happened. They went up to pray and they fell asleep. Their eyes were heavy. Maybe it was because it was a long hike up to that mountaintop and they were just tired. Or maybe they had been praying with Jesus for hours and now, oh, they're exhausted. They had to take a nap. While that was happening, Moses appears and Elijah appears and Jesus is dazzling white and bright and he is transfigured and he is glorified. They are all in their glorified state. A glimpse of what heaven might be like. A glimpse of Jesus' glory. And when the disciples were becoming more awake, a little more groggy, they saw what was happening and they pivoted from sleepiness to excitement and said, Wow, look at this. How wonderful. It is good for us to be here. Let's stay here for a while. Let's build a tent, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. But he did not really know what he was talking about. Then a cloud envelops him, and the voice of the Father tells what really is important. This is my beloved son. My chosen one, listen to him. Jesus is the one that we glorify. He is the chosen one. He is the Savior. He is greater than Moses. He is greater than Elijah. He is greater than the laws. He is greater than the prophecies. In fact, he is the one who fulfills all the prophets. He fulfills the law and the prophets the Chosen One, the Messiah. Listen to Him. And so the disciples had to pivot once again from seeking to glorify others to recognizing Jesus as the Chosen One. And so we pivot in life too, don't we? We can now Pivot from fear to joy. We can pivot from unforgiveness to freedom. We can pivot from doubt to faith. We can pivot from our burdens and our guilt to Jesus' grace and mercy. Whatever it is that has caused us to be stuck, that we can't move our pivot foot. God says, come to me, pivot to my grace. Come to me, and I will set you free. That is the good news of the transfiguration. That is the glory of God, that in Christ, we are loved and redeemed and forgiven. In Christ, we are a new creation. In Christ, we have the power of God working in us. In Christ is the blessing of the church. And so on Transfiguration Sunday, we give thanks and glory to God. In Jesus' name, by his power, for his glory. Amen.
Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard safe your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.